is July 2nd, 2020. And what is your full name? My full name is Margarito Garcia. And what is your birthday? February 21 of 1947. And where were you born? Uh, Texas. And did you grow up in Texas? No, I grew up here. So what t how old were you when you moved up to Michigan? 10. 10? And have you always been in Holland then after you moved uh, Penville here? area. Okay. Just south of here. And where did you go to high school? In Penville. And what year did you graduate? I did. You did it. Okay. So I quit school in 63, 1963, uh, in 10th grade. Okay. Um, I needed to help my dad out work. work. Okay. While you were in school, or even in that age range when you're a teenager, did you ever hear anything about Vietnam or about communism or anything yes. like that? What did you hear? What were the kind of the assumptions you had about <clears throat> Vietnam and communism? Well, I had Castro, the Cuban crisis. Mm -hmm. And then um, in 1964, I joined the Marines in 1965, but it, uh, in 64, um, <clears throat> we, the guy that I was hanging around with, we are talking about a, a new war that was going on, which was Vietnam. And we were 17, and me and another guy waited until 65, we turned 18, and then we joined the Marines. So what motivated you to join the Marines? Probably the uniform. <laughs> I bet you look good in that, huh? <laughs> I got, got married in it twice. Okay, so you joined the military in what month in 1965? October. Uh, so, we joined in the summer of 65, but okay. we had a delayed entry. Okay, so by October 1965, the U.S. ground troops have already, the Marines have already been coming into Vietnam. Yeah. So were you aware when, <clears throat> excuse me, were you aware when you joined the military or joined the Marines that you would be going into Vietnam? Yeah. Okay. They told us in boot camp, the drill sergeant said, most of you are going to Vietnam. So. Your butt belongs to the to the Marines now, and you go wherever they send you. So we, the whole time in boot in boot camp, we knew we were preparing to for deployment. Okay. And so, how long were you in boot camp, or what month were you in boot camp? Uh, from October, I started out on October seventh, and we graduated. They knocked it down to eight weeks, so we graduated December seventh. Of 65. And then what did, where did you go after that? Um, we went two weeks for um, advanced infantry training and then we came home. They gave us a 20-day leave, came home for Christmas of 65 and then I was here for 20 days then flew back to San Diego. No, to Los Angeles, and from there we bust to um, back to Camp Pendleton and for school's battalion because I was a uh, my MOS out of boot camp was 2,500, which is communications. Okay. <clears throat> and then, but it's a big field. Then they break it down like mine was 2,511, which is wire and telephone installer. So you lay all the wire for yeah. communications. Oh, yeah. that's... So we let, we, and, well, and then, I don't want to get ahead of myself. And then, um, they taught us that, how to install the field telephones, they call them. It's not your regular telephone. And then radio, how to communicate with pilots or other, other companies. So... I went there for a month and then another eight weeks of a staging battalion, that's where they, they teach you all the weapons. And then we boarded ship in April of 66. And that's when you started to head to Vietnam? Yeah, there was a ship boarded, boarded ship in San Diego and it Took 30 days but for for a person that's never been in the water for that long. It's sick. So Why did they sick. ship you and not fly you? I don't know. Yeah. They, I just didn't. Um, I'll get to that. Okay. Um, so we should we stopped in 
Hawaii. Then we stopped in Okinawa. And then we continued on to Vietnam. It took 28 days. That's what they said, 28 days. So you arrive in May in 66? No, it's, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. After you'd been on the boat that long? Yeah. Then we'd made, um, they had landing crafts. So we had to, we, had, we were in full combat gear. <clears throat> and then we, um, they issued us the rifles and ammo, live ammo. Loaded our magazines. And then we, we uh, in, well, in training, before we know, they teach you how to scale the side of the ship with a, it's called a safety net. I don't know what they call it. It's a, it's a netting, big old rope, bunch of little squares, and you just four at a time. And there's a little landing crab that where you, it holds about, I don't know, 12 people, maybe more. And then you just stand in there. And then they keep circling the, once it gets the capacity of how many people they're gonna go, keep circling under the ship until they're all, until they're all unloaded. <clears throat> then they form lines, a line, and then you hit the beach. And uh, did you land in Da Nang or another part? No, we, we landed in, um, it was, a, um, I think it was called Red Beach. They all different, different um, names. The one we landed, I think was Red Beach. And um, where the, the craft, <clears throat> hits the sand and then the door flops down and then you run out yelling and screaming. Yeah. What was your initial impression of Vietnam as soon as you landed? Um, I was excited. I didn't know what uh, what to expect. Before before we before we got before we hit the beach, the guy the the sergeant says, um, "Load your weapons." Lock and load, they said. So we put our magazine in there, ready for action. And when you, so you get to Vietnam, and um, do you get assignment to go somewhere else in Vietnam? Where well, this you... is this is what happened. The unit I was supposed to go to was in Japan. So <clears throat> they kept us in. Um, some of the guys got wherever they were going, their orders. But the orders that I had, the unit I was going to wasn't there. It was in Japan. There was four of us going to that unit. So they they, they took us into the name by truck to an R and R center, they called it. That's, that thing is old but busy. Hundreds and hundreds of guys in there. So they, the next day they took us, they, they put us on a, a plane for Japan. Got to Japan, reported to the, the, um, to the, co the company where I was going to. 30 days later, they shipped us back to Vietnam. And this time they flew us in there. So I got to Da Nang and then we went to the unit, then we started doing our work, laying wire and and what unit were you? Did you end up with? Um, I, the first Marine Air Wing, and um, but we were a service battalion. It's a service. That's what they, and I was in the communication section. So <clears throat> we laid up the wire all, all over the base. And did you stay in Da Nang at that time? No, we flew by helicopter. We flew to um, we flew to Chulai. Um, Couple other little hamlets, but there were Marines there already. Okay. <clears throat> and so your main job then was communications, like you said. Yes. So tell me about what a, a normal day would have been for you, like for would have been like for um, you in Vietnam. If you're not laying wire, you're standing guard, watching the guys that are working, to, um, watch, make sure that they're okay. Okay. Um, then at night. You might have guard duty. They might put you on guard. And, and that's that was the whole, the whole time. And then a few um, in the compound we're at, we get um, ordered 
at night, so you got to sleep in a bunker. So that was a, you're always on your uh, alert. <clears throat> and then you, um, you never have a day off. Sometimes it's hard to, to what day it is. You don't know if it's, the only reason that when they said Sunday, it was Sunday was because they, look, they said, okay, ladies, church time. And then um, the guy, the sergeant, always called us ladies. Then he would say, okay, ladies, put on your makeup. Time to earn your money. By, by that, he meant the camouflage. You camouflage your, your face. <clears throat> and um, so we go out on patrol or whatever. Where they needed it. Did you ever have any interactions with any Arvin soldiers? Interactions? Yeah. Did you ever fight with any Arvin soldiers or work with no. any of them? Um, in the part of the uh, Da Nang Air Base where I was at, the friendlies, they were Vietnam, Vietnamese people. Sometimes they, they work, they work with, they do work there. Um, I don't know who pays them. They would come and um, sweep the, the, oh, that's, the um, the CBs, they build us huts, wooden huts with a wooden floor, and then they then put a tarp over it, and that holds. Uh, and it was about the size of this room right here, <clears throat> with native with um, screen screen walls, because <clears throat> it's really hot, very hot. But um, uh, most of them spoke a little English. Uh, Vietnamese men and Vietnamese women. <clears throat> we had one young girl. Well, it wasn't she wasn't young? She was older than us. <clears throat> and they rumor had it that she used to be a Viet Cong, but she she switched to the South. Well. South, um, South Vietnamese at night, they're Viet Cong. And they, they say they could be working the fields, the rice fields, during the day and at night, they go out and try and kill Americans. And so did you have a sense of, or not necessarily fear, but maybe just anxiety around civilians because you weren't sure what they were? Yeah. 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 It's one of the things I suffer right now. Um, I was diagnosed with um, PTSD, and I got all that anxiety, and I dread Fourth of July coming. <laughs> but <clears throat> I live with it. Yeah. So why there in 1967? Um, you know, the anti-war movement is starting to kind of build up as American troops are being sent to Vietnam. Did you ever hear anything about, while you're in Vietnam, about the anti-war movement? Yeah. And did you have any thoughts about that while you were there? Mm, not really. I never thought anything about it. But I signed up for four years. So I had, I wasn't going to get out until 1969. And, uh, well, anyway, in, I was there the rest of 66. Mm -hmm. And, I spent Christmas down there. In um, May of 67, that was my, my year. Was the, in the Marines, it's 13 months. I have no clue why. In the Army and all the other services, you get one year, 12 months. Mm -hmm. The Marines, it's 13 months. So instead of, my year was up in April of 67, but I had to stay until May. Then I got orders came home. This time they flew us out. Uh, Cottonelle. Uh, it's a, a commercial flight. Yeah. Cotton what was that like? Was awesome. Yeah. And then we were, I don't know, 18 hours or 20 hours. I think we stopped in some island, I don't know where, stopped to refuel. And, uh, but they didn't let us get off the plane. Where did you arrive when you got back to the States after um, that tour? Los Angeles. And did you experience any issues with 
you know, American citizens, when you get off the plane, are you in your uniform or any nastiness or anything like that? No, but I'll tell you about that later. Okay. Um, the only people that greeted us there at the airport um, were the Hare Krishnas. Do you know what they are? Yeah, I do. And um, they dance and they sing and and they don't touch it. They just sing and so we were just walking. We walked to wherever we we're going to go. I think they, a bus. We bus us to um, Camp Pendleton. <clears throat> Got processed out. Came home for uh, 30 days, I think, 20 or 30 days in um, summer of 67. And I didn't see no demonstrations or anything like that. So I went back to Camp Pendleton, flew back to Camp Pendleton to um, LA, bus to um, Camp Pendleton, and then I went to a new unit. <clears throat> so I was there for the remainder of 67 and all of 68. So when you got, when you, you said you were in a new unit, are you still in communications during this time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And um, radio and wire. <clears throat> and that garrison duty is, it's, it's not good because you have to stay spit and shine and clean haircut and, and it's like a normal work day. You get up at five o'clock in the morning, and it's, it's not like you're in training. You're just working. Then you got, depending on, on your MOS, we are uh, our communication section. We just report it there every day, and um, clean the equipment, go for runs, and and uh, in the in the. In May of sixty, May of sixty nine, I had four four months to get out of. The, I was gonna get out of the court in in October of sixty nine. Well, they turned around and, and issued me orders for Vietnam again. So let me stop you there because why is it after you got your year or your thirteen months in the Marines would you have? Why would they send you back again if you've already done one tour there? By that time, I was a sergeant. And they 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 some they say um, I heard nobody ever told me I heard the, my career in CO that says the Marine Corps once you reach the rank of sergeant they consider you a career Marine they think you're gonna stay there for the whole twenty years. Okay. So <clears throat> they sent me the they gave me the orders they called me they you gotta come to the company office so I came here you go. So what's that? Orders. Orders for where? To Vietnam. So what was your initial initial thought? When, like, were you upset? Were you happy to go back? What did you think about it? Um, I um. Well, in a way, I was kind of glad to get out of there because I was there for over a year. And but see, and then and then I told him, I said, I'm getting out of the Marines in in, in October. They don't care. So by that time I was married to my first wife, and and she was six months pregnant. So she didn't want to stay in California, so I said, "Let's go to Michigan." <clears throat> and um, she stayed with my parents, um, and I left. I I flew back. We we, we flew here. And then we flew. I flew back. <laughs> anyway, my in, in, my daughter was born in in August of '69. She's 50 right now, 51. Well, she's gonna be 51. <clears throat> and um, when I flew back, this time I flew to um, San Francisco because I was gonna fly out at Travis Air Force Base. Well, this time, did fly out. This wasn't a ship. This was another, it was a commercial, I think it was United, I'm not sure. <clears throat> and this time we flew to, flew to Hawaii, and from Hawaii flew into Da Nang Air Base. 
Was anything different in Da Nang in that air base? Yeah, when you it left? changed. Yeah. It changed because I, I couldn't. The unit that I was going to this time, this time they changed me to. They they moved me to um, ground unit. I was uh, I was going to the 13th Marines um, artillery. So and the only the only way I could get to that to the unit was by helicopter. And then, um, so they flew me in there. It was a hill. A lot of hills have numbers. Mm -hmm. I was going to a hill, a hill 55. <clears throat> I flew us in. Well, I was by myself that time. So I just, I was like a replacement. But I guess I was already a sergeant. So the first thing they did was gave me sergeant of the guard. And during during the, the day, they showed me all the gun placements. This is where you got to check the guard, and you're the sergeant of the guard, and you got to walk. Up. And I remember that was a lot scarier than the first time because it was actually in the jungle. Mm -hmm. the, there was jungle all around except for the hilltop. We had concertina wire, um, barbed wire around. Um, we had machine guns. Um, the howitzers. See, I was in communications, yet I was already in this uh, artillery unit. And they had communications. But the communications, each gun placement had uh, telephones. So I got to make sure that they all work, make sure the wire is that goes from one gun to the other to the other. Make sure everybody had communications and radio. <clears throat> so here it is. Um, when I, of course, get motors and rockets and all that. So you have to be vigilant the whole time you're there. You cannot. So October rolls around. I'm supposed to be out of the Marines. So I went to the, the uh, company gunny. I said, I'm supposed to be out of the Marines. I said, it's already October, October 7th. He says, what can I do about it? I said, well, how about I get out of here? So, and then they started saying that the war was winding down. So <clears throat> that Nixon was pulling troops out. So the Third Marine Division, that was uh, where I was in, was pulling people out. So they pulled me out. Why well, was one of the first ones? Because um, I was supposed to be out already, but I was still in. I was still there. So they shipped me. I turned all my gear in. They flew me to. Uh, oh, they couldn't get a helicopter in there. They were afraid. Afraid to fly in there. <coughs> Well, they finally got me out in December of 69. Flew me to Da Nang um, Air Base, the R&R &R Center, which I've already been there before. Mm -hmm. Got processed out and boarded that plane. The Freedom, Freedom Bird, they call it. What did it feel like to step onto that plane? Sigh of relief. Okay, um, oh, on my way to, um, when we came back from from Japan the first time, um, did you ever see the movie um, Platoon? Mm -hmm. Where the kid, the guys land at the tarmac and there's a line of bodies, body bags? That's what happened. When I came, when we came back from Japan. In 66? In 66. There was a um, uh, eight or ten bodies. They didn't have the. They weren't covered with the American flag yet. They, were, they weren't in coffins, as a matter of fact. They were in body bags with just a little, a little white tag flying on from the zipper, mm -hmm. uh, the person's name. So that kind of jolted most of us because we were rookies. But coming back uh, now, jumping back to. December of 69, I, um, 
I didn't see any. We were just go from the R&R Center. They trucked us to the by the by the um, by the jet plane, the Freedom Bird, boarded up, and once it once it flew up and started flying away and higher and higher, it was a big yell. Everybody, yay! Homeward bound. Okay. So we landed in LA, and before they let us off the plane, they said, there's some war demonstrators out there, war pro protesters. So if you have any civvies on, jeans or, he says, take off your uniform, because they're gonna, they're gonna throw shit at you. Um, so I did, I think I had a pair of jeans and a shirt. So some guys had some, some didn't, so I changed. And I said, I wonder how come, why are they protesting us? So we, we left, we, we walked out almost in single file and, and people were throwing, somebody threw a book at me, or not at me, but at us, and I just went like that. And um, it was quite an ordeal. <laughs> I mean, you got you come from a war to fight another war here with your own people. Mm -hmm. That was. Uh, were you angry or like what? How were you feeling about that? Um, I did want to say, why are you doing this? Why are you throwing that uh, fruit? I think an apple or a lemon or something. Somebody threw at me. So for the next, I came home and just forgot about it. Met my daughter, she was three months old. Um, and for the next five years, um, I didn't, I let my hair grow. I didn't tell anybody about that I had, you know, I was a veteran. Cause they say you're afraid then he says, people were not going to hire you mm -hmm. if you tell me you're a Vietnam veteran. Just don't tell nobody. And <laughs> so that was it. And then in 75, uh, my brother came home from Germany. He was in the Army. He came to visit me in, in uh, California. So we joined... Uh, he, oh, he got out. So he says, let's go into the National Guard. I said, no, I'm done with the military. He said, no, come on. So he talked me into, we went to the local National Guard office, but we didn't have to go through the training because we were um, prior service. Mm -hmm. So they gave me un uniforms again, and here I was again. This time it was tanks. So, I had, a, I had a quite How long were you in the National Guard? Uh, I was there for, until 1982. And then my wife and I were on the verge of getting divorced. So, we thought a change of scenery might help. So, we moved back to Michigan okay. in 1982. And I was still in the National Guard. So the closest unit was the one here on 9th Street. I had to report to the nearest unit. So both me and my brother, we came to here. This time it was infantry, uh, 126th Infantry. From here they moved to uh, to Granville on 44th Street. So I, then in 1989, I got out. And did you join the military again after no, that? No, I'm done. Okay. I'm done. <laughs> so let me take you back. So you are out of Vietnam and out of the Marines in December of 69. And then in those five years following your second tour in Vietnam, did you follow the Paris Peace Accords in 73 or the fall of Saigon in 75? Yeah. What were your thoughts on that? All for nothing. I saw on, on the news where they were 
when they were flying the kids out of the embassy or wherever, out of Saigon. Mm -hmm. It was the fall of Saigon in 1975, mm -hmm. April of 75, I think. Since when we, we were completely out, they said we lost the war. The veterans here from World War II and Korean War, they didn't want us here, um, the BFW. Mm -hmm. They said because we lost the war. And they always said, um, we got two wins, one tie, and one loss. World War One and Two were victories, and then Korea was a tie, and the only loss was Vietnam. And when did that feeling go away in the VFW? Well, they didn't let it. They, oh, I'm talking myself. I came in here, and they didn't. Um, and I came in here in ninety, early nineties, I think, or mid nineties. It didn't. It, I wasn't treated well by the. But I bet hardly we have really have any World War Two veterans anymore, and Korean vets they're okay now. They, there's only one or two around here that I see. When you were in Vietnam in either of your tours, did you feel or did you know if you were exposed to Agent Orange during those times? Or I thought we were um, when I was in Chulai, and I get I go to the VA here in Grand Rapids. And I asked, I, I said, can I get tested for that? And he says, you're okay. Otherwise, it'll be in, in, something in your blood because I get my blood checked every year. Okay. And I pass. Every year I've been passing. But then uh, I get all these nightmares and anxiety. I don't know what else I got. So for, I was going to, I went to a counselor several times for about five, five. Well, it's starting getting worse, and this is all, the war's been over for 50 years. I'm 73, <clears throat> and I still, it's still fresh in my mind, everything. Um, my wife tells me that she wants to talk to this lady my my service officer that I went through the one that, that helped me out because I tell her that sometime one night I was I had her I wasn't hurting her but I was just holding her I says don't move because there's a, a Viet Cong over there in the corner and I was pointing to the corner of the bedroom and she wanted to know she asked me what am I supposed to do agree with you or or tell you there's nothing there it's a ghost you're seeing a ghost. I says, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Just So I, we call that lady to find out what is she supposed to do. What am I supposed to do? I still see him. Anyway, she sent me to a psychiatrist too. So they determined that I was 70% crazy. So. When you were in Vietnam, did you, any times in either tour that you would have interactions with um, the enemy, would you, would it be more NVA or more VC or pre -evil? Um It was, uh, I didn't, it was all VC. VC. Yeah, I saw one, um, one in particular that he was tied up, and I, so there's such little people, um, I don't see how, People like that can be so mean. Well, look at us. <laughs> um, they threw um, our food over there was C rations. I don't know if you've heard of them. But they threw him a can. He was tied up with his hands behind his back and his feet were bound. And somebody tossed him a can of C rations and he opened it with his teeth. So, um, I have a lot of respect for them people because um, they're fighters. They've been fighting. They before us. They fought the Chinese and mm -hmm. the French. Um, the French. Mm -hmm. So, and now it's all one. It's all one Vietnam. It's no sort, no north or south. What are you? What do you think the biggest impact of your service in Vietnam has had on your life? 
or what lessons do you think that you've learned from Vietnam? Oh. Certainly not work because they didn't teach me anything. But I don't do anything um, over there that helped me out in, in civilian life. Mostly probably my love for guns. And I, I can't be without a knife or a gun. I, I do now, I even bring it here, but at home I always, if I'm gonna be working out in the garage, mm -hmm. I strap on my, my gun. I was carrying a knife. I can't be without a weapon. And I can't sit with my back to the wall or door. Anywhere, restaurant, bar, wherever. loud noises. I'm always vigilant. But that's about it. What do you think is the biggest lesson that the country learned or should have learned from the Vietnam War? Our government, our people, did we take any lessons away from that war? What should they learn? Is that what mm -hmm. you um, don't take everything for granted. <laughs> and I hear, <clears throat> I heard in the news <clears throat> that uh, Russia was paying the Taliban. Yeah, to kill American soldiers. Mm -hmm. I didn't see them, but friends of mine that were in um, ground units, um, the actual going on patrols, and said they ran into some a Russian and Chinese. In fact, they 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 saw one that was shot, that was killed by 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 our by our army or Marines. Uh, he had on a red, or a red, they had a red star. Mm -hmm. It was a, it was a communist China and Russians. So they, they were helping the North Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. And Jane Fonda, of course, too. What were your thoughts on Jane Fonda? Um, when I was, um, I'm not going to tell you what they called her, because it's derogatory. Um, we, they showed us a picture of her sitting in um, a gun placement, mm -hmm. anti-aircraft gun. She even had one of those uh, safari hats. The North Viet this was the North Vietnamese War, some of them. And she was sighting in, like, looking at the sky through this telescope or whatever they had. So, right now we promised never to watch any of her movies. I haven't seen, as a matter of fact, I did see one of them, a recent one, uh, but I didn't see all of it, I just I didn't see it. Too many memories of her. Yeah. Um, something about a mother-in-law, a monster, mother-in-law or something like that. But, when I go to the, I went to a BFW and in um, uh, a seal, just on, yes, about 30 miles southeast from here. And I went to the bathroom, and the urinal thing had her picture there. At the drain. I said, wow. I'm, I don't like the lady, but I don't think I would do that. But well, what can I say? She did something wrong to us, the traitor. When you get back from Vietnam in 69, did you feel that, when any, you said that you had mentioned that you didn't tell anyone that you had served in Vietnam, but did you feel that no one in, the, in public would really talk about Vietnam? I, I don't remember. 
anybody talking about it? Because even um, when I got out, um, when I got out of the Marines, I came back here because my wife was here. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm gonna jump a little bit. We ended up we ended up getting divorced in in 1989. So, but anyway, my wife was here, so I came back, and I I bummed around jobs, couldn't find anything, so we decided to go back to California in 70, 72, 72 or 73, 73. And, um, and I got a job over there and nobody, I remember the application didn't say anything about being a, a uh, being in the military, I mean, there was no questions. Like, were you in a, ever in the military? Mm -hmm. The way now they do. And, but I've always wore either a hat or a shirt that is set Marines. But nobody ever questions. Now they do. After all this time, now they, now, now I get Think and when I go to a store. When did that start? You think that the country kind of started to be more open about it and talk about it, it and thank people. It started recently. I don't think five years ago, maybe. After the um, the the war that the war is on now, it's been it's been going on for twenty years. Mm -hmm. And and do you know who um, who? goes to meet these guys when they come back, Vietnam veterans. Mm -hmm. There's something that they never, uh, never welcomed us home. Mm -hmm. They really hurt. Yeah. Everybody hurt. To, to, to this day, it hurt. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I need to apologize. <sighs> to this day, it hurts. But I get over it. Do you feel that's one lesson we might have learned as a country that with the soldiers that come back from Iraq and Afghanistan now that they're more welcome than you guys were? Yeah. The, um, <clears throat> we had a lady mayor here in Holland. Mm -hmm. Her name was Nancy DeBoer. <clears throat> and one year, I would say maybe 2015 or 2016, she threw a party for the, at the Civic Center for the Vietnam veterans. Welcome home, mm -hmm. um, Vietnam veterans. It was packed. She shook my hand, gave me a hug. And then she's not the mayor anymore. And in, in um, Howard County in um, um, Indiana, they have a Vietnam veterans um, um, every year. They have a, a Vietnam veterans uh, welcome home um, party. I went there one year. It's real good. Okay. Really, really good. Only Vietnam veterans. They're all gray and old like me. <laughs> Have you ever been to the wall in DC? Yes. And what's your impression? What did you feel when you were there? I started bawling like a baby. <laughs> like by um, <clears throat> when I backtrack a little bit in 1964, in 65, there was out of my class in 60 in 63. Um, let me see, um, me and Victor, Dale, Bill, about seven of us, seven of us, seven guys from the same class also all went to Vietnam and two didn't come back. One of them, Victor Canales, um, I bought a tile for him out there in South India. I'll show it to you when we go to the, uh, the in the lobby, yep. and he's over here at the Penville Cemetery, just outside town. And the other guy, um, 
He was in the Marines. And Dale Hammond, he didn't make it either. From what I heard, he was a medic, and he's he died trying to save people. So medics would have had a really dangerous job in Vietnam, but what about radio operators? You got the target. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have to carry a radio yeah, at all? You did? Yep. And what did you feel like on those types of patrols when you you had to carry the radio? Um, I I grabbed the, um, I never had the whip, because it's called a whip antenna. It's, it's about, um, it puts together like a tent um, pole, mm -hmm. but the tape antenna is real flexible. So what I did, I I grabbed it and I stuck it into my uh, one of the straps that I had. Unless I was going to communicate, then I just it would spring right up. Did you feel that it made you a target? Like yeah. When it was up. They said the life expectancy of a radio man was. Uh, 7.2 seconds or something like that. <laughs> but they say you sign, when you sign the, your contract for the Army Marines or whatever, you just like sign your life away because, I mean, it, your life belongs to Uncle Sam and you know, you paid in full, including your life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you want to share about your time in Vietnam or your time in the service or anything that you would that we didn't cover that you'd like to share? You know, traveling, which if it hadn't been for the Marines, I wouldn't have, well, I, Vietnam for one, but I wouldn't have traveled to Japan, the Philippines. <clears throat> I went to the Japan, the Philippines, Okinawa, Hong Kong. I don't think I could afford to go to places like that. But that nah, was fun. I liked it. I even got a tattoo of it. <laughs> I'm proud of my service. I just wish that um, when we came back, they would have accepted us. Now they do. Now. 50 years later. Yeah. They'll stop me and shake my hand. And my wife and I were. Uh, at um, Bob Evans having breakfast one time. And uh, when we went to pay the bill, I said, oh, it's already paid for. Huh? Yep, they didn't want, they didn't want to let you know. It says they took care of it. They didn't want you to know who it was. I said, who was it? So I can't tell you. Bob Evans and another guy at the IHOP, same thing. So they care now, which before they didn't. Yeah. So. Mike, thank you so much for sharing your story with me today. Oh, I was going to tell you. Um, oh, yes. Please add more. No, no, I just going to put my name. Um, yes. Margarito mm -hmm. Garcia. And when I was in the Marines, um, we always called each other by your last name. They never call you by your first name. So what's your middle, what's, what's your initials, M? And the phonetic alphabet is Mike. Mm -hmm. Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Foxtrot, Echo. Oh, there's, a, there's a name for every letter of the alphabet, and M is for Mike. So that's where it came that's from. That's how you got your nickname? Yeah. I was wondering that when you said your full name earlier. No, it doesn't. <laughs> And then I was I was also in 81, 81 motors, 81 millimeters, mm -hmm. but they call them 81 mic mics. Well, thank you so much for having me. Oh, you are so welcome, Mike. Thank you.